Good morning. Good morning and welcome to St. Stephen's in Redditch. If you're here for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. And it's a very warm day, so it's a warm welcome to everybody today. I'm extremely warm, as you can imagine. Um, there aren't any particular notices this morning, apart from saying the Heritage Open Day is here on the September the 17th. So if you'd like to be involved in that in any way, speak to Elaine or Keith and they can tell you all the very many ways that you can volunteer for that day. I think one of those ways is just being here, which I'm sure some of us can do. So let's just uh, have another brief moment as we gather our scattered senses and come before the presence of God. Welcome in the name of Christ. Grace, mercy and peace be with you and also with you. So we're going to sing our first hymn now. It's Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. Do be seated. And we say together prayers of penitence. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let everything be said and done in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through Jesus Christ. Sing psalms, hymns and sacred songs. Let us sing with God with thankful hearts. Open our lips, Lord, and we shall praise your name. We're going to say Psalm 80 together. Um, I will say the uh, odd verses. I have to make sure I get this right. And if you would respond with the even verses, that would be great. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. You cleared the ground for it. You took deep root and filled the land. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. The boar from the forest ravages it and all that move in the field feed on it. The stock that your right hand planted. But let your hand be upon the one at your right hand the one whom you made strong for yourself. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. We have our first Old Testament reading by Irene Griffiths. The Old Testament reading is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, and this section is headed, The Song of the Vineyard. I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up, cleared it of stones, and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower and cut, down, cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now, you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard that I have d done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in, and he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, 
but heard cries of distress. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We come to our second hymn this morning, so if you're able, please stand as we sing All My Days. Our New Testament reading is Hebrews 11. Oh, please do be seated. <laughs> it's not the gospel. <laughs> it's Hebrews 11, 29 to 12, 2. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheeps, sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, 
did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not without us be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now you may be wondering to yourself, after hearing that scripture, why on earth I'd choose it to preach on this morning, <laughs> and I might be slightly bonkers in choosing to do so, but well, that remains to be seen. But we have been so fortunate recently that the, uh, Birmingham has been hosting the Commonwealth Games. Who's been to see some of the games? I know some of the children have, yes, Gail and the children. And what did you go to see? Commonwealth Games. What did you watch when you got there? Netball. Was it really exciting and good fun? Yeah? Anyone else been to see any? Oh, yes, what did you see? Weightlifting. Was it good? Yeah, excellent. And there are so many stories of athletes taking part against all the odds, overcoming great adversities to compete in the Games. It's been truly inspiring, hasn't it? So there's um, Luke, uh, like Sankit Sagar, the 21-year-old Indian weightlifter. Did you see Sankit? Maybe? No? <laughs> um, but his day job is helping his father run a tea shop. And he hurt himself mid-competition, but still went on to win a silver medal. And then those, there were those inspiring stories from those who are baton carriers. Did any of you see the, the baton being brought round? Yeah, yes, oh, excellent. Yes, it seemed there were so many good choices about who should have the honour of carrying the baton. Wasn't there someone from one of the local congregations? that Vicky Corton, maybe? So you see, not everyone taking part in the Commonwealth Games were there to compete, but everyone took part. So this scripture today doesn't say, win the race. It says, run the race that is set before us. That's great news for all of us. We just need to take part in the race, that's it. What God has set before us. We are not required to win, but we are required to take part. And if I were sitting where you were, where you are now, I'd be saying to myself, that's all very well, but how do we do that? How do we take part in the race? First of all, you need to feel motivated. And I'm sure that every single athlete taking part in the Commonwealth Games had to be really dedicated to train so hard in order just to be able to take part. That's the same for us. Their motivation might have been to win or to be placed on the podium with a medal or to beat their previous attempt or achieve a personal best. The Hebrews reading began with setting out some of the motivation we have to run our Christian race well. That motivation is the example of those who have run it before us. Remember, this verse follows immediately on from um, the heels of the Hall of Faith. There, the author, who is probably Paul, describes a whole host of committed believers who have run their race well. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets are to be our examples. Perhaps we could read about them again. So more than being our examples, they are also our cheerleaders. They are later referred to as a cloud of witnesses. Picture running a race on a track and the stands on every side filled with people who are cheering for you and calling out your name. Though we can't see it, that's what's going on in our Christian life. We are surrounded by the saints who have gone on before and that is meant to encourage us to run well. If you have ever run a race, I haven't. <laughs> but if ever you've run an actual running race or sat on the sidelines and watched one, you know the power of hearing people cheer one another on. Someone who is winded and barely able to lift their feet suddenly hears the voices of their supporters rallying them on and just like that, they have renewed determination and motivation to keep going. 
As we run our race, we must remember the example and encouragement set by all believers who have run before us, not just pillars of the faith, like the ones mentioned. We should also remember others whom God has graciously placed in our lives. Maybe parents, siblings, vicars, perhaps, teachers, friends, and mentors. Let their godly example motivate us to run well. Runners taking part in a race explain the importance of finding another runner who can be their pace setter, someone whose speed will challenge your own. You make it your goal to stick behind them during the race. I have two prayer partners. We pray together. We started at the start of the pandemic and we still meet, albeit still virtually, every week. They are my pace setters. So who can be your pace setter? Who will you join in imitating their Christian life? Who will be your example and encouragement? Who will motivate you to run that race that's set before you? Answering that question is the first step in running well. Next, we see that in order to run well, we must cast off our weights and sins. Lighter means faster. If runners want to perform their very best, they will make sure they're not weighed down by a cumbersome load. In this context, the word weight could refer to extra layers of clothes that slow us down or get in the way. Flowing robes aren't exactly the entire for running. So take time this week to consider what weight or sin you may be carrying that's slowing you down or creating unnecessary weight on your race. The writer of Hebrews says that once we find our motivation and cast off our weights, we need to run with endurance the race set before us. Endurance implies that the Christian life is better compared to a marathon than a sprint. It's something that takes work and commitment and courage. It can't be completed without preparation or practice. Otherwise, we'll burn out in no time at all. Think about it. You wouldn't run a marathon without any preparation, although my son-in-law did just that and wasn't very well at the end of it. But you wouldn't sensibly run a marathon without any preparation. You just don't show up on the day of the race and expect to do well. Rather, you sign up months ahead, sometimes a year ahead. You learn what kind of course it is. Will it be hilly or flat? Will it be hot in that time of year? And so on. You take lots of things into consideration. So too, in the Christian life, we must prepare ourselves for what lies ahead. This is what it means to count the cost of following Christ. There's a price to be paid. It won't be easy. Discipleship requires endurance. Following Jesus may mean trial and tribulations, but we can't allow those hindrances to cause us to give up. And indeed, if we're expecting them and are prepared for them, with the Holy Spirit's help, we won't give up. When we see the course that is set before us, we will not be surprised. We'll be ready to run, come what may. Are we prepared for the race set before us? It's a lifelong one. It will take endurance. But the good news is that the endurance comes from God himself. God strengthens us for whatever he calls us to do. Finally, we want to consider the most important aspect of running our Christian race well, keeping our eyes on the prize. Yes, we need proper motivation and encouragement to run. We need to rid ourselves of things that would encumber our progress. We need to prepare for the long haul. But none of this matters if we don't keep our eyes on the prize. In this case, that doesn't mean a trophy or a finish line. It means looking to Jesus. This implies we've already begun our race and that we must continually keep our gaze fixed forwards or upwards, as opposed to backwards. We're not to look back on the things that we've left behind or the things we've cast off, like keep reminding ourselves about things God has already forgiven. They're in the dirt and the dust where they belong, whereas we are headed for glory. Colossians offers similar advice for the Christian life. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Running a race well can never entail looking back. Looking back implies our heart and our desires and our loves are all still back at the starting line and not in the kingdom of God. When we look back, we reveal that we actually belong with the world and the things of the world and not with the world to come. Let us run toward the kingdom by keeping the eyes of our heart fixed on the one who is where we want to be. 
the one who has already run the race and come in first, the one who stands victorious in the heavenly places and is waiting to share that victory with us. Let us keep our minds and hearts fixated on Christ, who is the price, who is the prize at the finish line. Amen. Please stand, if you're able, as we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please sit for our prayers today. Almighty God and Father, help us to be still in your presence that we may know ourselves to be your people and you to be our God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Holy God, with our diocese, we commemorate, commemorate International Youth Day, celebrating young people and bringing attention to the challenges they face around the world. We pray for your face to shine upon them. Bless Simon Hall, our diocesan youth officer, and his work, Look with light upon our own Youth Alpha endeavours and give our young people a glorious and fulfilling time on their trip to Alton Towers. We pray for all young people known to us. May they find peace, guidance and the stability they need in this rocky world. Show us how to reach out with love and welcome so that they become the f future of your church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we pay, pray for peace and com compassion on this planet. Bring peace and reconciliation to all places, suffering drought, hunger, disaster, violence, injustice, war, terrorism. Lord, the list is long. The climb is steep. Sometimes we find ourselves losing all heart. Give us persistence in our prayer. We hold before you the Ukraine and its people. We don't need to put into words our horror and our despair because you know what's in our hearts at all times. And all we can do is to pray for the peoples of the world and trust in you that the leaders of the nations may uphold what is right and good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for our town, our local communities, our church fellowship, our friends and families. Give inspiration to all who make up the fabric of our society and fill our people with love and generosity and kindness. We know this is a big ask, Lord, but we also know that nothing is beyond your influence. So in, humili in humility, we ask that the Holy Spirit will, in some mysterious way, make this happen. We pray this too for all who have lost their way or who have gone astray and for all who are living below their potential or their abilities. Free from anxiety, 
those who are beset with financial worry. We pray that ways will be found by those with the authority and power to save this ship about to sink into an ocean of energy poverty before it is too late. We raise before you those whose lives are unfulfilled and others whose lives are restricted by illness. We remember the chronically ill, those in constant pain, the depressed and the despairing. Encourage and console them. We pray for your healing presence to be with Cliff. We pray for your continuing presence with Noel and all of Gail's family. We give thanks for the continuing recovery of Philip. And in a quiet moment, we bring to mind those others who we know who need your prayer, our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we pray for those we have loved and lost. May they forever inspire us onwards and remind us of the responsibility we have to future generations to lead the way in turn. We give back to you, Lord, those you gave to us. Your Son taught us that life is eternal and that love cannot die. In our closeness to you, help us to be close to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, inspire us through your love to fix our eyes upon Jesus and the great company of those who have gone before us to persevere and to run the race in faith to your glory, amen. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And together we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And the collect for today. Gracious Father, receive your church in our day and make her holy, strong and faithful for your glory's sake. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We come to our final hymn now, so if you're able, please stand as we sing, There is a Redeemer.
please be seated. We say together, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. 